why why Anderson County? What what led you to to Anderson County to become the new girls basketball coach there? Well, um, I really didn't have Anderson County in mind, to be honest. My name was um, submitted as a recommendation for a new coach, and I got a phone call from the principal, and he, you know, kind of gave me the rundown about the situation with the girls' basketball team at the school and um, asked if I'd be interested in submitting an application. And I said, you know what? I have nothing to lose. Coaching high school would be fun. And um, I submitted my application. Didn't hear anything back for almost a month. So I figured, you know, I probably didn't get it. So I kind of just almost forgot about it, had it really in the back of my mind. And then last week... I actually got a text saying, hey, can you show up at Tuesday, 9 a.m. for an interview? So I'm like, whoa, okay, maybe they are interested. <laughs> so um, showed up Tuesday morning, interviewed, and the rest is history. Did you ever, back when you were playing, did you ever see yourself becoming a coach? Was this kind of the goal that you were working towards, or are you? do you feel surprised to be in this position? Well, when I was a player... Um, I think I was more focused on academics. I've always been kind of nerdy. Um, I've always really enjoyed um, school. I've always enjoyed learning. And so I saw myself more um, going to law school, becoming a lawyer, maybe one day becoming a judge, you know. So I was more focused on academics than I was my athletics. However, when I was a player, all of my coaches from the time I was in college to, you know, when I was a professional, um, they would always say, you're a pretty good player, but you would be an amazing coach. You need to look into coaching. And at the time I was offended because I'm like, I'm a player now. (laughs) I don't want to think about what I'm going to do after I'm done playing. I just want to play, you know? And so that I thought was offensive, but now, um, that I'm older and I'm looking back on those times and I'm looking back at the amount of coaches that told me that I'm realizing that they saw something in me that I didn't yet see in myself. Um, and that is that I, I, I am going to be a, a great coach because I'm willing to learn, you know, that's, and uh, I love to learn. That, that's really funny. I, you know, because you do hear there are certain players that coaches will talk to and, and they, they, they stress kind of about, wow, you'd be a great coach. Isn't that? I never thought of it from like, from that perspective, that's funny. It's not like nobody wants to hear that when they're a player. <laughs> it's like, oh, this playing thing isn't really working out for you. <laughs> Maybe you should look into coaching, you know? So it's like, it's not a fun thing to hear as a player. But now that I look back, I see that they were really just trying to get me prepared for life after basketball. Did you ever imagine that you would be back here in East Tennessee? Um, you know what? I like Florida. I like being on the beach. I like the warm weather. Um, so I always imagined that, you know, once I got done playing, I would buy a house close to the beach in Florida and just enjoy life, which I did for a while. But in true Nikki fashion, I am like an ultra competitor and I just could not live the beach life. (laughs) (laughs) After a few years of relaxing, I was like, man, I have to get back out there. You know, the competitive juices were flowing and I just wanted to get back and compete, you know, even if it's not as a player, you know, um, competing as a coach, you know. And so I came back to Knoxville because this is where I remember competing and competing at the highest level and you know I didn't think it would be in this way but everything has come full circle you know I thought that my competitive juices would flow when I got to UT and I was um, a grad assistant with the lady ball basketball team Um, but that didn't work out you know and for a long time I was like man why didn't that work out you know it was seemingly perfect you know I thought it was the perfect setup Um, And I questioned it. And so now to get this Anderson County job and to also be a teacher, it's like, this is better than anything I could have dreamt up because I have a passion for teaching. I loved being a teacher. I was a um, sixth and eighth grade teacher for three years in Florida. 
Um, so I get to go back to that. But then on top of that, I get to be, you know, a varsity girls basketball coach. So it really is the best of both worlds. What's your what's your go to course? Like what's the what is the the class that you like teaching the most? I love really any type of history. I taught world history and US history. Um, and then before I decided to come here, they were actually going to put me um, in civics. They were going to move me to um, a civics teacher. And so I really enjoyed um, U.S. history. I really enjoyed world history. And when I looked over the curriculum of civics, I really enjoyed that um, curriculum. So um, I like the social sciences. I believe that um, Anderson County will put me in one of those courses, which I really enjoy. And what's really fun about it is that history is almost like teaching reading. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I really, really love to read. I'm an avid reader. And so I get to use a lot of those um, reading techniques to teach history. And so, you know, I just kind of like history. I do a lot of project-based learning. we do a lot of reading, but the reading is really interesting, and I get to do that all over again here. So I'm just, yeah, I'm excited to get back in the classroom. I, I was thinking about, wow, how am I going to decorate my classroom this year? Because I was like, I used to go all out. <laughs> my classroom used to be decked out. Yeah, so I'm already excited to decorate my classroom. What, what are we? You, you gotta paint the picture for me now that you say something like that. What are, what are we talking with the classroom? What are we looking at here? So uh, my last year as a teacher, I was a U.S. history teacher. So I went on Amazon and I basically ordered every red, white, and blue item I could find. <laughs> <laughs> and so I bought these beautiful ruffled red, white, and blue table skirts and. I um, put them around my desk. So my desk had this beautiful ruffled red, white, and blue um, table skirt. Um, And then I also had um, a supplies table because I do a lot of activities. And so I had the same ruffled skirt around my supply table. Then I had stars and stripes everywhere. I mean, it was beautiful. I loved my classroom. (laughs) It, 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 sound, it sounds really like you went all in. You, you didn't just kind of do it. You, you did the whole thing. I went all in. I really did. I mean, people would come. Uh, we were a Title I school. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, people were constantly in and out of our school um, from the state, you know, monitoring us, giving us feedback. And wherever they came from, they always commented on how beautiful my classroom was was but it literally took me five straight days from (laughs) in the morning till five at night (laughs) to get my classroom the way I wanted it so um yeah I mean I just feel like when your classroom is beautiful it just sets the tone for the year and so I plan on doing the same thing when I get to Anderson County and I start decorating my classroom that that was always one of my favorite um things about like the first day of school was just like walking into the teacher's classrooms for the first time and seeing kind of what they had in mind. You get, you get a really good vibe off of like what the teachers, who, who yeah, they are based exactly. on how they decorate their classrooms. It's true. You have to start the way you intend to finish. So, you know, if you start on a positive note and you start in a classroom that really just puts the students in the mood to learn, then that's going to carry through the rest of the year. I really, really believe that. Um, now, now, obviously, you know, uh, a Lady Vol coming back and teaching in East Tennessee and coaching in East Tennessee, uh, you know, that gets so many people excited. It's, it's such a cool, you, you mentioned full circle earlier on. Um, at, what, what were your experiences like as a Lady Vol and did that draw you back to East Tennessee at all, you think? My experience as a Lady Vol was, um, it was interesting. You know, I was not, um, one of the best players that came in in my recruiting class, but I knew that regardless of whether I was ranked higher or lower, which I was ranked probably on the lower end (laughs) compared to the other recruits that came in with me, I knew that I could control my work ethic. And I just told myself, Nikki, you can't control where you were ranked. You can't control, you know, the talent that you were given. You can't control your height. Um, and how high you jump, all of those things, but you can control how hard you work 
And so I made a commitment from day one to be the hardest worker on the team. And I did that for four years straight. And so that just kind of became my identity. And it worked for me. You know, I broke into the starting line up my freshman year and I never left. Um, and so, you know, I just tried to make my career about working hard and it paid off. And so I would say that is how I would define my career is I was not the most talented player, not the most graceful, <laughs> but <laughs> I did work hard and, you know, my teammates respected me for it and they fell in line and, you know, we became the hardest working team in the country and no one ever thought we would win a single championship. If you go back to the videotapes and you watch ESPN and you see the predictions, they never predicted that we would win anything. But it goes back to that work ethic, and I believe that I was able to infect the rest of my teammates. You know, once they saw how hard I was working, everyone else just, was, you know, started working equally as hard. And so we won, not because we were more talented, but just sheer grit, you know. And so I would say that defines my, my college career is just being the underdog um, you know, our team, contrary to what people say, we were the underdogs. And so we had to really fight and scrape and claw our way to those championships. Um, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that, actually. I, uh, we, have, we have like an archive system back here full of like videotapes and all kinds of things. It goes way back. Um, and uh, right around the time, actually, it was, it, it was when your brother was uh, deciding that he was going to transfer to Tennessee that I was like looking back at like some of your old tapes and that that really surprised me so much because like there were like little stories that we did leading up to I think it was the 08 title where you know there was a talk of just like how much of an underdog you were and if you weren't there in the moment you may forget because you see that Lady Vol name and you just immediately associate it with with dominance and greatness but you know it, everyone loves a good underdog story so that's always great. Yeah. And even after, we felt so disrespected. I just remember feeling like, wow, we won in 2007, and people still think we can't win a championship in 2008. <laughs> so it was like, what more can we do to, you know, garner the respect of, you know, the media? Yeah. You know, they didn't respect us as a team, which, yeah, on paper, we weren't the best team. But I did feel like we deserved more respect than what we got. Um, and so the best way to gain respect is to beat everyone. And that's what we did. <laughs> and so um, it motivated us. We used it as motivation to um, to win that second championship. And I see a lot of that in my girls team at Anderson County. You know, they did not have a good record last season. Um, they won one single game. And so next season, there might be teams, you know, who don't really take us serious, you know. And, and so we're going to be underdogs in a major way. And you know, the same way we use that as motivation when I was in college, you know, I, I want to infect my team with that same uh, mindset that, you know, even when everyone counts you out, sheer grit and determination will take you a long way. I was actually, I was about to ask, how does that mentality that you had as a player, that work ethic, um, you know, that, that sheer grit, how does that translate to your coaching style? How do you see that rubbing off on, on these girls? It's huge. It's huge because, you know, I was never the superstar of the team. I was never scoring 20 points a night, um, but I was still important. And I would say for majority of players, they're not the superstar, you know, um, but they are still important. So the lens that I look at the game through um, is different than someone who was the star player. You know, I know what it's like to feel like I'm working so hard and I'm not getting results, you know, or I'm working so hard and no one notices it. Um, and I think that, you know, there are a lot of players on a basketball team who they're doing the small things, you know, and those are the thankless jobs. And I was the player doing those jobs, you know, um, doing the rebounding, doing the defense. You know, that's not going to get you on the highlight reel on ESPN, you know, getting a defensive stop. It's just not. But it's important, you know. You need those things in order to win championships. And so I look at the game through the lens of 
um, a blue collar player. And, you know, the blue collar players, even though they're not getting the recognition, they're really what drives teams to win championships. And so, you know, my hope is that our team can be full of blue collar players. And, um, you know, I really think that's going to bring us the success that we want. Uh, now, anytime a former Lady Vol um, it becomes a, a coach somewhere, obviously the question kind of comes back to Pat. Um, you know, what kind of influence was she on you um, as a person, as a player, as a coach, and, and how do you kind of continue that legacy of what you learned under her? I would say as a person, um, Pat was unapologetically herself. <laughs> and I'm the same way, you know, and that's something that I took from her um, and that I never want to lose. Regardless of who's watching, I'm myself, you know, I'm authentic, I'm real. And your players realize that. They know the difference between who's real and who's not. And when they know that a coach is real and a coach genuinely cares and is there for them and is there for, um, you know, a common pur purpose, you know, the same purpose that they have, which is to win, things just move a lot um, smoother and so I would say I learned that from Pat is regardless of who's watching um, even if you're completely by yourself be yourself you know and, and don't apologize for it and um, you know I was like that in the interview when I interviewed for the coaching job at Anderson County and you know there are times where I get nervous I'm like oh you know I'm too real <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if people are ready to handle this you know but they embraced it. And so, you know, that's why I know I'm at the right place. So, you know, as a person, I would say that, you know, Pat inspired me to just be myself and not, not make any apologies because of it. Um, as a player, I would say the, the most important thing that I took um, from Pat is, is work ethic. Um, you know, just when you think you're working hard, you know, come to the realization that you can work even harder. You know, you've never arrived. That was one of her famous sayings. You're, you've never arrived. Um, and then as a coach, I would say um, where we won championships was in practice. Um, if there's a team that worked harder than us in practice, I would love to see a practice, you know, because I just cannot imagine it. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine there was a team in the country that worked harder than our basketball team. Mm -hmm. And that's why we won. You know, you don't step on the court as a player. You know, you step on the court uh, for a game and win. That's not when you win. You win in practice. And so, um, you know, Pat's philosophy was you practice harder than the game, and then the game will be easy. And it, it, it was true. It was true. You know, we practiced extremely hard. Um, I just can't imagine that there was a team that worked harder than us. I just... I really can't. Even now, I'm sure it's not a team that worked harder than us. Um, and that's why when we got to the game, it was easy, and we had a lot of success. Um, and that work ethic and everything we did in practice covered up a lot of our deficiencies. And so, you know, I'm going to take that lesson from her as a coach. You know, my team is going to practice hard. I want to be able to say there's not a team in this country, there's not a high school team in this country, I dare someone to find one, that works harder than us in practice. You know, that's that's my goal. I want to be able to say that. Mm -hmm. um, powerful words all around. Um, pardon my ignorance here, but is the, where is this your first head coaching job? Where does this fall in terms of your coaching resume? So I really have been coaching since, you know, like I've been coaching since I was 16. Mm -hmm. Not seriously. But, you know, I'll, I'll coach, like, at camp and, and different things like that. So I've been doing that for a long time. Now, when I became a teacher, um, like I said, I was at a Title I school, and so we did not have um, a lot of people that wanted to coach because it was basically a volunteer position. Mm -hmm. So I coached my boys' middle school team and my girls' middle school team. So I was the head coach of both. Um, and then simultaneously, <laughs> I was an assistant coach for a high school that was 
um, around the corner from my house. And so, you know, in those three years, coaching those three teams gave me so much experience because what I noticed is that the same things I had to teach for the middle school level, the high school players still needed those basic fundamentals, you know? And so what I also noticed is once I got here for, um, you know, to be a graduate assistant, the college players also needed those fundamentals. And so, you know, I believe coaching middle school was the best thing I could have ever done because it forced me to teach small details that make a huge difference. It forced me to go all the way back to the basics. And what I noticed is that even on the high school and college level, those foundational skills are still important. So, you know, do I have a ton of high school experience? You know, I have three years as an assistant coach. But, um, you know, the three years coaching boys and girls middle school basketball, that was the best thing I could have ever done for my career. Because I think for coaches that start at the college level, they don't understand that you can't assume that just because those kids made it to college that they know everything they don't they need those foundational skills they need those fundamentals and so thank god i started at the middle school level where i didn't have a choice i had to teach those things effectively and um so i feel like i'm more than prepared i think i'm even more prepared um to do this because i coach middle school um than a coach that maybe they could have found who used to coach college i would i would say that i'm probably more prepared than someone like that yeah and the the timing of this um, with with you know you coming back to East Tennessee as a coach now and then and then your your brother coming in to, to play for the Vols what did you guys plan that is that, is, was, that was that the grand scheme <laughs> <laughs> we did not plan it at all like no this was completely random like I said you know I kind of just put the Anderson County job in the back of my mind I'm like. Well, haven't heard from them in a month. I probably didn't get it. So, you know, that was my mindset. You know, I didn't think that I got it. I thought they had hired someone else. So there's no way we could have planned any of this. You know, it really was just a work of God. Mm. How, um, how how are you two handling the transition back in? I know this is probably a it's, it's a tough time to be accepting a new job. It's a tough time for him to be going to a different school. How's, how's everything going with you all? You know what? Um, We're more glass half full type Mm. of people. Um, And so we have to believe that something good is going to to happen and that all things are going to work for our good. And so we have not let ourselves get down. (laughs) Um, You know, we just got back from working out. Um, You know, we're trying to stay in shape. We're trying to stay on top of um, our game, so to speak. And we're just taking things one day at a time, you know, if it's hard, um, social distancing and, you know, going through this new era of COVID-19, yeah, it's hard, but we're trying not to think about the negative and we're just trying to enjoy all of the blessings that are almost overwhelming at this point. I mean, for him to be here, you know, at UT on the men's basketball team and for me to get a head coaching job at Anderson County and a teaching job and, you know, for me to be, you know, getting married (laughs) also, you know, that's another huge milestone. Um, So, I mean, there's just so much we have to be thankful for that we literally just, like, bask in all of the excitement.